Alex here with part 157 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I will take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero. If you haven't seen it yet, that's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not an unmentalist right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. For those of you who are annoyed of my disclaimer, given that it's part 150-something, <laughs> part 150, I think three, four, five, and maybe six didn't have the disclaimer included because it was sort of a... Uh, multi-part video of my hearing and I got those emails on um, people worried that you know if your case is open or why are you doing these videos guys without the disclaimer that's the immediate instinct people have when they see the video so I have to give the disclaimer so that people know that it's a um, an educational series not a sort of a revenge series or asking for support series so we go into now um, the Supreme Court opening briefs that I filed um, this is the first appeal that I am about to win. It's the appeal on the costs that District Judge Chuck Weller denied in the writ petition case. My mindset at the time is not clear. I remember being hopeful, but at the same time, I hadn't won any appeals yet, so I can't imagine that I was exhilarated to you know in the sense that I knew for sure that I was going to win um, I felt like it was a clear issue I felt like the law was was perfectly clear on this and that if you know I was about to win an appeal this would be the one that I would win and I wish I could remember more about my mindset but I think that this is going to be one of those videos where we really just have to go straight into what I have filed <laughs> Here we have my appellant's opening brief. This is, um, again, the first appeal that I win. So this would be the opening brief that would be a good idea for you guys to, I guess, give more um, credence to, if that's the right word to you. I'm not really sure. Um, scrolling down, you can see that I give the standard introductory paragraph, which I'm not actually sure is correct. I've used this for any motions that I have filed in the lower court, but I do think that there is, um, I don't know if the right word to use is traditional. I do think that there is a, a different traditional um, sort of introduction that you give to an appellate court when you file an opening brief that is not the same as what you would include or lead off with in um, like a motion or opposition or reply that you filed in the lower court. So again, um, not sure about this standard introductory paragraph really being a standard thing to use in the appellate courts. Um, I have The only reason I say this is because I've seen other opening briefs done by attorneys and they don't look like this on the first page at all. In fact, if any of my viewers knows what I'm talking about and they want to post anything down in the comments, especially if they have like a link to what it's supposed to look like when you file an opening brief, go ahead and do that for us and I'll try and pin it so that other people can find it. I think maybe... I figured this out by the end of my child custody case, but I am not 100% sure. So just kind of a heads up to you guys, if you want to file your own opening brief and you want it to look professional and the way it's supposed to look, just giving you guys a sort of a heads up that this may not be, in fact, I think it's probably not the correct way to address an appellate court when you file an opening brief. This uh, Rule 26.1 disclosure is required according to the Nevada Rules of Appellate Procedure. I talk about the importance of taking a look at those rules in the video, statutes, rules, and case law. And I also think I underline it specific to the appellate courts in the video filing an appeal. Make sure if you're filing an appeal in your state that you take a look at those rules of appellate procedure and um, include the things that you have to include. Uh, 26.1, um, as far as I can remember, is for corporations or 
Yeah, I think it's for corporations, and you're supposed to disclose to the appellate court, at least in Nevada, because it's a Nevada rule. There's a percentage threshold. You're supposed to disclose who owns the corporation if it's over a certain threshold. I believe it's 10%, but this is a completely wild guess. So there may be, I don't know, maybe more or less than that percentage amount. And you're supposed to give the appellate court a list of the particular people that own that percentage or more in that corporation. They probably use that to determine whether or not they need to disqualify themselves. But that's also a wild guess, so don't quote me on that. Here we have the table of contents. Why do I have a table of contents in my opening brief? Because the rules of appellate procedure say so. They require you to include a table of contents, and that um, amounts to basically breaking down the sections of the brief and letting the appellate court know which specific pages those specific sections begin on, similar to a table of contents in any other book that you may have read. Here we have the table of authorities. It doesn't specifically say, at least as far as I can remember, that you're supposed to break it down into statutes and cases. I think it does, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I probably got this practice from having taken a look at um, attorneys' opening briefs, and I am pretty sure that most of them separate the statutes out from the cases. Some of them also separate the court rules out. I can see here that I have lumped court rules into statutes but I do think that some attorneys break those out as well, and so they would have three different sections. Um, essentially, you're going to let the appellate court know which statutes, court rules, and cases you are relying on in the brief, and you're going to let them know which pages those pop up in. Jurisdictional statement. This is, again, required by the rules. I'm going to continue to repeat that to really get you guys to understand why it's so important to read those rules. These things are not just being included in here because I think they need to be included in here. The rules of appellate procedure specifically tell you, you need to have this and this and this and this and this and this in your opening brief. If you don't do that, you're not in compliance with the rules and your brief may be rejected. In any event, the rules require a jurisdictional statement, or at least they did at the time that I did this, and that portion of the brief is you letting the appellate court know why they have jurisdiction over your appeal. Those rules typically cover or at least involve two different things as far as I can remember. Number one, is the particular thing you are filing an appeal on even appealable in the first place? Um, and I believe that goes into what type of order it is you're appealing and whether or not it's dispositive. I guess those can be the same thing. The second thing is whether or not you are even I guess you could say this might even be lumped into the first thing, but I do know that it's a big deal to explain to the court that you are a party. Because in some situations, you need appellate relief and you're not a party to the case. For example, sometimes an attorney will get sanctioned and they will want to file an appeal and they really can't because they aren't a party. They have to file something called a writ petition. I've talked about that before a few times in my series. If you want to know more about what those are, please watch the video, writ petitions. Um, I think I kind of misspoke earlier when I said there were two parts. I guess you can kind of lump that into the first part. There may be something that I'm just not thinking of right now that I wish I could think of. But in any event, I'm going to go ahead and move on because it's just not coming to mind. Um, you guys can take a look at this for yourselves. But the first section here goes into the fact that this is appealable because it's a special order after judgment, which is one of the uh, subsections of the court rule that talks about whether or not something's appealable. And then I mentioned a couple of cases that explain or define what a special judgment is and or special order after judgment. And then the second section goes into the fact that I am aggrieved because you do have to agree be aggrieved by the order to even file an appeal. If you're not an aggrieved party, you just can't appeal. And then the third one discusses where original jurisdiction came from. And in this particular case, it came from the Second Judicial District Court. And the reason that matters is because sometimes people will try to file an appeal from a jurisdiction that cannot get to the Supreme Court through a direct appeal. For example, the Justice Courts and the Municipal Courts. For those particular jurisdictions, the direct appeal goes to the District Court. Hey guys, this is a little technical, but I, it's better for me to let you know that I have a completely separate video dedicated to this topic, and that video is titled Filing an Appeal. It goes a little bit more into detail as to all of these particular things that I'm mentioning. Statement of the issues. This is a really brief 
I guess, as you can see in my case, it's a quite literally numbered out list of issues that I want the appellate court to consider in this appeal. Number one, did I waive my right to an appeal? Because the judge in the lower court says so. I disagree. Number two, was my ex a party to the proceeding? Number three, should my ex be considered a losing party? Number four, um, should my ex be considered an opposing party? Number five, did I waive my right to recover costs? And number six, um, did the district court fail to allow me an opportunity to respond? All of these issues tie you know, into this appeal perfectly. All of these issues are part of why I should prevail on appeal. Statement of the case. This is a really brief one or two paragraph statement as to what's going on in the lower court. And I just summarize here briefly that all of this started with the publication of the Supreme Court uh, Falcone v. Secretary of State case. Under that case, I had the, um, I guess you could say the right to file a writ petition in the lower court and have my ex forced to show whether or not she was truly and actually a victim of DV. If she was a victim, etc., etc., that all of this is sort of explaining to this court why I had a right to bring this case in the first place. And then I mentioned in the a lower section of this paragraph that I prevailed and that following um, having prevailed, I filed a motion for costs, which the district court summarily denied. Here we have the procedural background. This is actually, as far as I can remember, not a requirement under the rules of appellate procedure. I think I just broke this down from, maybe I just included it. I can't remember now if they require you to include a summary of the facts. And if they do, that may be sort of what I broke out from the summary of the facts. I'm not sure. As we progress through the opening brief, we'll see if that pops up later on. And then I'll be able to confirm to you guys that that's what I did here, that I split apart the procedural facts, which is, you know, when, you know, what dates and times were things filed and the actual, you know, the true facts to the case. In any event, let's get through this part. With the procedural background, I just go through line by line and explain date by date chronologically what happened procedurally in the lower court. The court entered an order granting motion to proceed in form of papyrus on May 13th. On May 15th, I filed a petition for writ of mandamus. On November 22nd, um, we appeared in court at a hearing. My ex failed to appear. On November 25th, um, I filed my memorandum of cost together with my motion for costs. On December 24th, the district court entered the writ of mandamus. On March 3rd, the district court entered the order denying costs, and on March 19th, I filed a notice of appeal. We go into the summary of the argument. This discusses very briefly what is the argument in this case, and I am mentioning that this uh, the district court based its, den its denial on <coughs> um, the a variety of different notions, most of which I addressed in the list of, I think it was called the list of issues, but I'm kind of regurgitating those particular issues now. I'm saying, hey, the court said that my ex was not a party, that um, even if she was, she was not a losing party or she was not an opposing party, and that I waived my right to tax costs. The court hit me on quite a few different issues. The court was basically trying to twist itself into a logical pretzel. I know I've used that phrase before. To find some basis or some reason to deny me that motion for costs and the court lost. Or you'll find out that the court will lose. This whole analysis is wrong and they'll reverse. Legal analysis. Here we go into the actual details of the appeal. My first paragraph is me mentioning that the lower court concedes that 18.020 subsection 4 mandates an award of costs in the underlying action because a writ petition is a special proceeding. So this is me saying, hey, the lower court judge admitted that under the law, because this was a writ petition, which is a special proceeding, an award of costs is mandatory. The court is instead going to rely on a few other bases to deny that motion for costs. First, he is going to say that the award of... Wait a minute. No, wait. I'm leading a little bit too far into it, I think. So I'm not mentioning the other portions of the judge's basis. I'm just mentioning at this point that he has admitted and conceded that ordinarily I would be entitled to an award of costs. I guess I address the other parts later. The next assertion that I make is that an award of costs will not be disturbed on appeal unless the district court abuses discretion, which is correct. That's the standard. If you want to learn more about why the standard of review matters, please watch my video on the topic standard of review. 
I'm mentioning that the district court entered the writ. The district court denied my request for costs. I don't know why these last three sections here, lines one, two, and three, are even in here because I already mentioned this in um, the procedural background. I don't think I would put these in here now. In any event, let's keep going. Wait a minute. It's like everything is being repeated. Hold on a minute. Let me see if I accidentally included the same page. Yes, that's what I did. Sorry, guys. Take a look at that. Page six was included twice. So we have page six and we have page six again. Well, that explains the confusion. <laughs> I'm going to continue on now. Um, at the very bottom of page six, we go into the abuse of discretion that I'm asserting, which is part of the standard of review. We have another case that explains that an abuse of discretion is, quote, a clear ignoring by the court of applicable legal principles without justification. And the last portion is that the issues that I present to the appellate court are pure questions of law. And questions of law are subject to de novo review. I could explain this more, guys, right now if I really wanted to, but I don't want to do that because I have a video dedicated to this particular assertion. If you want to learn more about why it matters that you're bringing to the court pure questions of law, please watch my video, Standard of Review. Next section here is that I did not waive my right to an appeal. This is the first assertion that the lower court makes. So here I am grappling with that assertion straight out of the gate. I am um, bringing up the fact that the lower court has noted that I stated in my motion for costs that I will not appeal an order in relation to my ex and my request for costs. This is wrong. And <laughs> right away I'd say, this is not the case. I don't know where he got that from. What I actually stated was that, quote, I have no intention of appealing an order that declines to require my ex to pay the filing fee to the court. And that merely cites in authority because of my aforementioned pledge to Chief Judge David Hardy to have my ex, um, wait, well, yeah, that's what I mentioned to the Chief Judge to have my ex pay those costs to the court. I see what I'm saying here is that that's not my basis for appealing this right now. That is my basis for abandoning that issue in the lower court because that's money that the government's entitled to. And if the judge wants to screw the government out of the cost the government's entitled to, then it's fine by me. I'm not going to really do anything about that on appeal. But I will be asking for the costs that I individually am entitled to. Um, and I am bringing up, I guess, the word this in quotation marks by basically what I just told you guys, which is addressing the portion of costs that mandate um, the award be paid to the district court. The district court only needs to look, or this court on appeal only needs to look back a single sentence to confirm everything that I'm saying here. My next assertion here is that waiver is the intentional relinquishment of a known right and that it is the district court's prerogative if it wishes to deprive the government of fees it is statutorily entitled to, but that the such an order does not aggrieve uh, me, nor do I have any interest in pursuing or appealing that particular denial. A denial um, by the district court, you know, to pay my to order my ex to pay me filing fees is what I stated I would um, appeal. Let's go into the next section here. My ex was a party to the proceedings. The district court raises a number of points that appear to challenge my ex's status as a party to the underlying litigation. This is true. I did not expect this court to, quote, infer that the named individual is a party to the case, unquote. Um, why am I asserting this? It looks like, okay, I see what I'm doing. I'm attacking the lower court's reliance on Campione v. Sessions. So District Judge Chuck Weller relied on this case titled Campione v. Sessions to argue that I guess my ex is not a party to the case or something like that. Or I guess to argue that I expected him to infer that my ex was a party to the case. And what I am doing here on appeal is I am, to, you know, direct frontal assault. I'm, I'm aggressively taking that case that he relied upon and I'm picking it apart. I'm saying, you know what, Campione v. Sessions, which District Judge Chuck Weller relied upon to deprive me of my cost award, isn't even applicable. And I'm going into why it's not applicable. What happened in that case is distinguishable from, from uh, what happened in our case. In that case, the party was not named. In my case, I did name her. I specifically named her as real party in interest. So there's no expectation by me that she be incorporated into the case by reference. He just pulled that out of his ass. Um, I'm going in. I think that's all I'm really covering here with this first section. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and move on. In the next section, um, I'm arguing that my ex was a losing party. So the district court noted that, quote, there is no case law in Nevada defining losing party, unquote. 
The district court concedes that I prevailed in my action. So he's admitting that I won um, just because the court, <laughs> uh, just because the <laughs> just because there is no definition of what a losing party is, doesn't mean that the lower court cannot infer that a losing party is basically the opposite of a prevailing party. So I'm, I'm arguing all that right now. It's logical to conclude that if you're not the prevailing party, you're a losing party. Uh, I'm bringing up a couple of cases here, Bass Davis v. Davis, and it looks like Valley Electrical Association versus Overfield. So his argument that my ex is not a prevailing, or his ex, his argument that my ex is not a losing party is just not, you know, going to hold water. Next, we have um, the assertion that my ex is an opposing party. So I guess the district, it's, as I go through this appeal, the lower court's arguments or the basis for denying my motion for costs become more and more ridiculous. Now, here I am telling the appellate court that my ex was an opposing party, despite the fact that the lower court thinks that my ex was not an opposing party. So I'm doing the same thing that I was doing two issues back, which is that I am aggressively, you know, grappling with the lower court's reliance on another case, and that is Connerly versus State Personnel Board. The lower court tried to assert that Connerly versus State Personnel Board is a basis to deprive me of costs because my ex is not an opposing party. And here I am on appeal telling the appellate court that Connerly is vastly distinguishable from the instant case again. In that case, they are trying to clarify, if not draw an exception to the active participation in litigation rule established in previous cases, namely that despite an amicus curiae's active participation in litigation, it is exempt from being considered an opposing party because of the purpose and function an amicus curiae serves. My ex is nowhere near the role of an amicus curiae. I cannot think that he imagined I would file an appeal and bring this to the appellate court's attention. I just have to tell myself as I go through this that this district judge must have thought that I would be intimidated by his analysis on denying my motion and that I would not take it up on appeal because this argument, this case that he is citing is way off track. This case is only meant to protect amicus curiae. My ex is nowhere near the realm of amicus curiae in this case. If you want to know more about, I hope I have a video on that topic. Take a look at my channel, guys, and take a look and see if I have a video on the topic amicus curiae. What those are are friends of the court. They are not parties to the case. They are just there to, to sort of pipe in, to give the court more of a background. And to try and say that my ex is similar to them is ridiculous, to be quite frank. So this is me, and I guess um, the district court is also citing McGuigan versus City of San Diego. <laughs> and that case actually does more to support my case than the district courts. So here, I'm halfway ridiculing District Judge Chuck Weller because he has cited a case, McGuigan versus a City of San Diego, that's, that actually bolsters my position. Somehow he has it in his head that that makes his position stronger. But if you take a look and read McGuigan versus City of San Diego, you'll see that in that court, they affirmed a refusal to award costs on the basis that, quote, the city, a settling party and fellow respondent in the third party's appeal challenging the class action settlement was simply not an opposing party to the current appellant when the fees were incurred. Rather, these parties were allied in interest in defending the settlement for which they had sought and obtained court approval, unquote. The McQuigan court further recognized, quote, the dictionary definition of opposing is opposite in position or active in offering opposition. An opposite party means an adversary in litigation. Thus, we can construe that the term opposing party as used in section etc etc was adverse to that of the prevailing party. My ex is in no way aligned with me. In the underlying manner, as I go through this brief, I just get more and more fired up for why the, the district judge bent over backwards to the point of breaking his back to defend my ex, despite the fact that she didn't even file an opposition. Let's continue on. My ex actively sought and obtained a fictitious address from the Secretary of State in 2009. My ex and I 
are diametrically opposed in interest for these several reasons. My ex is an opposing party with respect to me citing McQuigan. So it's like, thanks for citing that case, District Judge. That actually supports my position, not yours. Let's go into the next uh, section here. I did not waive my right to recover costs. Um, the fact that he even had to bring this up in his order makes me highly suspicious that he was pulling a CYA maneuver, that he just wanted to cover himself just in case that I filed an appeal, and that he was crossing his fingers and hoping that the appellate court wouldn't look into his assertion. The district court is asserting that under Lagois versus Second Judicial District Court, that the costs in the repetition cases can only be taxed against the respondent. But the Lagois court did not hold that. It did, they didn't say that at all. If you take a look at that case, it only went so far as to reject the Second Judicial District Court's argument that the lower court should not award costs against it because of its official status as a district court. Basically, the status of a respondent as a district court does not preclude recovery of costs against it. Lagua is not restrictive in any sense. If anything, what it is doing is expanding the ability to recover costs. It's not saying that you can only recover costs against the court. It's just opening the door to recover costs against the court. Anyone else that you can recover costs against, you could still recover costs against. Next paragraph here is that the district court recognized and in part appears to base its decision on this court's presumption that in La Gua, quote, in most cases, costs have been paid by the real party and interests and not by the respondent court or the respondent judge, unquote. If this is true, then this provides precisely the vehicle by which the district court could have granted my motion. So this is another situation where he is arguing a case that does more to support my position than support his. This is why judicial activism doesn't work. This judge should not be doing what he's doing. He should not be rallying to the cause of my ex. He, he, all he's doing is making himself look biased and quite frankly incompetent. This is absolutely outside the boundaries of the role of a judge. He is, by trying to defend my ex, he is making himself look like a bad judge. Let's go ahead and move on to the next section here. Um, there is an issue that despite my waiver, taxing costs against my ex will be unfair in the instant case. This court, quote, concluded that the Secretary of State was required to issue the fictitious address to my ex, upon the presentation of the temporary restraining order, the fictitious address program did not authorize the Secretary of State to investigate or determine whether a protective order was issued based on the finding of domestic violence or on a finding of a potential threat of violence before approving the application, unquote. He cites my own case, and um, it is my ex who submitted the application for a fictitious address complete with the lie that she was a victim of DV. It is my ex who burdened, who is burdened with proving substantial questions at the underlying proceeding Costs should be taxed against my ex, not the government. So once again, I'm using the lower court's citation against him. Going into the next assertion here, the district court failed to allow me an opportunity to respond. That's true. As an initial matter, I note that the district court misunderstood the scope of my request for costs. The district court recognized my assertions that my ex, quote, deliberately dragged this proceeding out, unquote. This was specifically in the context of the underlying proceeding. I am not as the district court appears to believe, trying to recover costs on any other proceedings. I don't know why he thought that. I kind of feel like he was playing dumb there and trying to act like I was trying to recover costs in all the proceedings that were before him. I'm not. I am only trying to recover costs following the publication of Falcone v. Secretary of State, which I am entitled to do. Next assertion here is that the district court, quote, notes that the amount of costs sought by me is not large. However, neither my claim for postage nor copies is supported by receipt for payment in the amount claimed, unquote. And then I bring up my memorandum of costs and I cite exhibits one and exhibits two. I purchased my stamps from the federal post office and made copies at Kinko's. This whole argument is pointless, guys, because my ex never filed a motion to retax costs. And the Supreme Court is going to hold that if, you're, if you file a memorandum of costs, then that's good enough. You don't have to file any sort of additional proof unless your opponent files a motion to retax costs and there's an evidentiary hearing held on that issue. In this particular situation, there wasn't one. And so what he was trying to do was just kind of create rules out of thin air 
that I would be forced to follow. Those rules did not exist. He does not have the right as a judge to just create rules out of thin air and require people to follow them. It was totally inappropriate for him to do that. So this entire section here is pointless. I don't even have to do any of this. It, I was being nice by going above and beyond and giving him what I didn't have to give him. And so what he did was he basically exploited good faith and used my kindness against me as a basis to deny my motion for costs. The Supreme Court is not going to be amused by what he did, and they are going to specifically address this in their order reversing. Next, we have the conclusion, which is that I asked the Supreme Court to reverse the lower court's denial of my motion for costs and instruct him to award costs against my ex. Here we have my verification, which is just me asserting under penalty of perjury that everything in this opening brief is true and correct. Here is the Rule 25 Subsection B Certificate of Service, which is similar to Rule 5 um, in the Rules of Civil Procedure that just requires you to certify that you have mailed this document to all of the parties in the appeal, which I did. That's it. Next document is Order Transferring Case to Court of Appeals. This case is being transferred to this is interesting because I could have sworn that the Supreme Court reversed on one of my cases maybe I maybe I'm out of order here maybe another appeal is being handled at the same time I think that's what's going on um I could have sworn one of these cases is reversed by the Supreme Court I'm pretty sure about that anyways don't worry about that guys it's going to come up in the series so eventually it's going to come up but for whatever reason this particular case is transferred to the Court of Appeals. So this particular case will go to the Court of Appeals for disposition. And if you want to learn more about that, you can take a look at the Nevada Rules of Appellate Procedure. It is specifically Rule 17 that discusses what types of cases get diverted to the Court of Appeals. Going into the aftermath, I filed one document. That is a free filing, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex is not authorized to participate in this appeal. So she will occur, zero, incur zero dollars in costs. She also is not going to incur any attorney fees. So that's going to be zero dollars in attorney fees for her. I didn't have an attorney on appeal. So I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees myself. If you have any questions, as with my previous videos, feel free to post those questions down in the comments below. And I will see you guys next time.